Hi everybody, welcome back to Owl City Homestead. Kim here. So I have been promising myself and you guys that I'm going to plant some spring flower bulbs and I have been putting it off but today is the day I start. I've got 350 bulbs to plant, not counting a few that I need to dig up and divide and move around. These are just new ones and I'm really looking forward to it because I've actually never planted more than a few random bulbs here and there and this is kind of exciting. Um, but I've been putting it off because I've been busy, of course, <laughs> like everyone the last month or two, but also because here in zone 9B, the ground hasn't been wet enough or soft enough for me to want to get out there and try to plant. And I haven't needed to because the ground never freezes here. So we've now had a few good rains and I'm definitely ready to plant the bulbs that are going either in raised beds today in my backyard veggie garden slash a few flowers now here and there to attract bees and in some of my pots, my flower pots out front. And then next week, I'll probably plant the other two thirds of my bulbs because they're gonna go in the ground and we're supposed to get a lot of rain the next three or four days or relatively speaking for this area, a lot of rain. So the ground will be a lot softer and I will have a much easier time putting the bulbs in it. So this is the first place I'm going to plant. In past garden tours, I've mentioned that in the middle of this raised uh, hill culture mound, I am going to put bulbs on either side of the pineapple sage plants. And in the middle there, there's a, um, a aster that's struggling through the winter, but there's actually a lot of uh, new growth coming out on it. So I think it'll be fine. Uh, pineapple sage, on the other hand, it uh, has absolutely no problem with the weather year round here. So on either side of these three plants in the middle, I am planting Allium nigrum. There's 15 of those. And Allium purple sensation. There's 10 of those. I'm actually going to, you know, mix them up every other one, I think, probably, or two in one. We'll see how that goes. These are um, both, of course, in the Allium family, and they both get about 30 inches high. They both are supposed to be planted about five inches apart, but I'm going to fudge that. I'm probably going to put them three to four inches apart. Um, everybody seems to cram their bulbs a little closer than recommended and not have any problem, so I'm going to do that. So these um, bloom purple and white. Um, respectively and uh, so that's I think going to go really well with the white alyssum and the violet um, lobelia that comes out more in the spring and summer and I think that'll blend really pretty. I know the pineapple sage has red blooms but I just like those and that's okay. The aster is purple so that blends it all together and of course um, if you've been following along you know that on both sides of this mound I have two rows of garlic. And if you happen to notice this big pile here, I'm starting to gather a bunch of random branches and twigs and stuff I want to burn. I'm going to have a burn pile in the next day or two and get that going. All right, let's get these planted. It should be pretty simple. So I took my handy dandy tool. I laid it out between the garlic rows so you can see it. It's about a uh, five and a half, six foot branch. Relatively straight, very sturdy. And on the end of it, I've marked it every two inches with a black marker and that helps me make the holes for planting very simply and totally free and I have plenty of branches around this place <laughs> with all of my olive trees and mulberry trees so I took this tool this gardening stick we'll call it um, and I just dug aside the mulch in a straight row on either side of the pineapple sage and now I'm going to use it to put holes in the ground and then I'm just going to pop those bulbs in there. So this is what the Allium Purple Sensation looks like. And if you've never planted bulbs before, one side always has some roots or it's flat and the other side is pointy. These are interesting. They're more like a very small tangerine or maybe a golf ball size and they're kind of round, but you can clearly see the roots on one side. So they're going to go root side down and into the hole. These holes are five inches deep. I'm finding that that stick wasn't quite as wide as these bulbs, so I'm pushing down a little bit further, but now it's in there. 
Now I'm gonna cover these a little bit with the dirt here, and then when I'm done with the whole thing, I'm going to spread a little bit of um, garden soil on the top of it. I got a bag pretty cheap last week just to make sure I had plenty of coverage for these. And I'm being careful not to um, go farther on either side because I do have the garlic on both sides. And what else? Oh, I wanted to point out that you don't need to put uh, fertilizer in these holes with the bulbs. Uh, you just don't. The bulbs have everything they need in them and they are set. They will grow just fine in the spring without any added fertilizer. So if you feel like your soil is super lacking in the proper um, nutrition for these bulbs, if it's really heavy clay or just super sandy or something like that, then I would suggest amending your soil with some organic material, some organic compost. Um, but if it's just slightly lacking, you might want to add a little bit of bulb tone. But in general, you know, 90% of the time I'd say you don't need to add any fertilizer with your bulbs. So I'm just going to plant these. I'm doing the purple ones first. That way I can be sure that I get them in the right spots because I'm putting them um, roots down again every other one and then I will put the white ones in after that All right, I'm just putting some soil on top now. Not heavy, just filling the hole in and firming lightly. I will be putting the straw mulch back on lightly. Probably tomorrow though, because I want to get these finished planting. Okay guys, I'm in the sun now, so I hope the glare's not too bad. Uh, but boy, it feels a lot better than where I was over there in the shade. So this is my flower bed here by the steps, and I'll show it to you in just a second. And I have a bunch of gazanias, orange and pinks, alyssums, whites, pinks and purples, and some osteospermum down on the end that's kind of a maroon shade. And I have this open area right in front of me that's like three or four feet long. Uh, well, right in the center of it is some alyssum, purple and pink and white together, a little clump. But on either side of it, there's about two feet of open space where I grew some uh, Indian gym corn this past summer, which did okay, but not great. I'm going to try that somewhere else next summer. But uh, I'm going to put some bulbs here. And here, I don't want some any really tall ones, whereas those alliums I put in the last bed in the garlic raised mound bed, uh, those got a, are going to get about 30 inches high. These that I'm going to put here are freesias, and they only get, let's see, they get about 12 inches high, so that should be fine. They'll be the same height as my two large gazania bushes and the same height as the osteospermum at the end. And they'll be taller than the uh, alyssum in the middle, but that's okay. And these are double pinks, freesia double pinks. Now I love freesia. It is one of the only bulbs I've ever purposely planted before. Um, the others would be canna lilies and tulips, but only a few of those. But freesia, I planted some bright, um, vibrant orange red ones in the front a few years ago three years ago I think now and they've come back every year of course uh, they're very very hardy and they're the first flower bulb flower that ever bulbs uh, for me um, I already had bulbs here when I moved here seven and a half years ago I had a bunch of bearded irises of different kinds um, that's, I think, the only bulbs that were here. But from my research, Freesia is one of the first to come up and flower. And sure enough, of all the bulbs I bought of many varieties, um, they definitely are the first. They say they come up and flower in winter or very early spring. And that has been my experience. So I'm really excited to plant these. I don't have any pink ones and these are double pink. So they have two different shades of pink. Not really a pink person, but apparently I really like these when I saw them online. And I'm gonna try to put pictures of all these flowers up. I, I should be able to do that. Uh, from Longfield Gardens, that's where I've gotten all my bulbs this year. 
I couldn't resist their colors. And I also tried to get a range of blossoming times from the earliest Freesia all the way into uh, mid-summer with some of the uh, bulbs. Now, the Freesia go four inches deep and about four inches apart. Again, I'm gonna crowd them a little closer than that so I can get a really full appearance here. And that's about all you need to know. They go in full sun to part sun. They're gonna be in full sun here. And I know because I have Freesia out front in full sun that they do fine with that here. So let's get going and plant these Freesia. So I'm just gonna dig a trench here all the way down the length behind the alyssum and then in front of the alyssum on either side of it. Whoops. And up here. This ground is pretty soft. As I mentioned, it has rained a few times recently, which is a big deal around here. So I think this should be good enough. I think I'll be able to push the bulbs right down in there now that I've uh, dug this trench. So the freesia bulb is small. It's about an inch, maybe a hair over, inch and a half at the very most. And it's very much pointed on one end and flat on the other end. So very easy to remember to put the little pointed end upward facing. Although, you know, don't worry too much because if you get a bulb that gets in there sideways or if you're totally not sure, <laughs> I don't think that could happen with the freesia, but some bulbs perhaps. And if you're totally not sure and you just put it in sideways, the, the bulb knows how to grow. It will seek the sun. This ground is super soft, um, so it's pretty easy to plant these. I feel like I'm maybe planting them too close together. Um, my experience with Freesia plants out front is they've been pretty big plants once they grow, but I think that's a sort of an optical illusion because they, they have a fan kind of uh, display to them. They're leaves come out in sort of a fan style and their actual root base probably isn't that large well we're gonna find out we may have a very crowded freesia collection here in the spring but you know what that's okay that is okay i think i'm about done here um yeah i'm Finding a little space for the last two. You know, gotta crowd them in. Put that one right there. All right, now I'm just gonna cover them up. And I did bring the bag of garden soil over here in case I wanted to add a little extra. I might add just a tiny bit extra. Never hurts to um, add some either compost to your beds or some fresh soil, either that you've made yourself or that you've gotten a deal with. Just make sure it doesn't have any chemicals in it, anything uh, you don't want in your garden. And hopefully this is going to be the first thing that I see new in the spring. I can't really say the first flowers I see in the spring because I have flowers year round. Here, alyssum, gazanias, uh, geraniums, um, wallflowers. Uh, what else do I have year round? Violas, they're year round. Lobelia to a lesser extent. A lot of them last through November and then they take a break for three or four months. That would be the case with several. Okay, I think we're done here. Let me show you how the bed looks as a whole now. 
So starting on this end, I have my gazanias, which are different shades of pinks and yellows in there. And then a bunch of white alyssum. And here is where I planted all of the freesia around that clump of pink and violet and white alyssum. There is a little gazania right there. I'm gonna take that out and put it somewhere else because it doesn't need to be in the middle of that. So yeah, the freesia, double pinks are all around that. And then we have more alyssum, another um, medium-sized gazania I'm gonna take out, transplant somewhere else. A big orange gazania plant going strong. Some yarrow that I need to prune back a little bit and some white and violet alyssum. And the burgundy osteospermum. So I think that this section right here is gonna look really pretty in the spring with those spring with those um, double pink freesias. So this is the next place I'm planting bulbs, so this very long cement block bed. And I have gazanias and walking onions for the most part planted in the squares of the cement blocks. In the two sides of this bed are two different things. On this side, I have uh, bulb onions planted. Did that about six weeks ago. I think they're sweet onions. I have to look at my paperwork to remember that. And on this side, I have garlic bulbs. Now I'm going to be in that center trough you see that I dug out with my handy dandy garden stick tool. I'm going to be planting hyacinths. Here we have hyacinth city of Harlem and hyacinth woodstock. And I have the same on the other side ready to go in. Now there are five bulbs in each bag, so there's gonna be 10 on each side of the center little flowers there, the snapdragons. And uh, the woodstock ones bloom purple in mid-spring and the city of Harlem ones bloom, see if you can see it, yellow in mid-spring. You're supposed to plant them both, all of these hyacinths, about uh, six inches deep and supposedly six inches apart. So that's great. I have never planted hyacinths, but I love how they look. There is something though that I didn't know about hyacinths that I will now tell you about. It's very, very important. Now with hyacinth, it's pretty obvious which side is the bottom. You have the flat, rough root side and the tapered, pointy side that goes on top. Now I'm touching this with my fingers and I should not be doing that. Why? Because hyacinth are toxic. Uh, they're not toxic to the touch. They're toxic if you eat them. So animals and toddlers, you wanna keep these away from them. However, they're not just toxic edibly. They're also a very, very common allergen to almost everyone. And I can attest to this. So I should not be handling these with my hands. I should be using gloves. One thing though, you can bet, I am not going to touch my face with my fingers. I'm gonna interrupt my little lesson to show you this. This one looks like I don't think it's gonna actually blossom. It looks kind of dried out, very different than the other ones, but I'm gonna try. No harm in trying. So yeah, I found out because I, you know, got all my bulbs out today, sorting through them to see what I had and what, what I wanted to put where. And I had never heard of such a thing as an allergen uh, causing bulb. And in fact, I don't have any allergies. I've never been allergic to anything in my life. Um, whether eating it or touching it or breathing it. I don't have hay fever, just nothing. So it never occurred to me that something like that might happen. And I only realized what was going on, or I should say I only admitted what was going on after quite some time, because I did start itching pretty quickly after I got these out. I was in the house with them. They were on the table right in front of me and I was moving them all around and my face was pretty close to them. I'm sure I was breathing it in. And that is how the allergen happens. You see, it's not actually the bulb itself that causes the allergy, it is, well, you know, that's what they say. I kind of would that d disagree. It's part of the bulb, an element of the bulb. And what it is, is there is a element called calcium oxalate, a mineral, I guess you would call it. And it is, let me turn you around so I can see you. 
So calcium oxalate is given off as a dust. If you're outside and it's windy, you're certainly going to experience this. And I, being inside, um, experienced it because I was really close to the bulbs. I had them all laid out on the table in front of me and I was bending over them, constantly rearranging them and reading their tags. And I was, yeah, lifting them up, moving them around and touching my face and neck. And that's what happened. I noticed it first on my neck um, and my cheek, my jawline, my side of my neck. Oh, just touched myself. Uh oh. Okay, don't do that again. <laughs> um, and I tried to ignore it, yes, deny it, because I never had allergies. But after a few minutes, there really was no denying it because it became severely itchy and it kept spreading. The dust particles are in the air and if they touch your exposed skin, like your face, your neck, your upper chest, like it did for me, um, it causes the different reactions for different people. But my research showed that it's really a sensitivity almost everyone has to this calcium oxalate. It's just a matter of how sensitive to it are you, which will determine how severe the reaction is. My reaction was, uh, I'd say, pretty intense. Um, but then again, I don't know how intense it can get. And in fact, right now, I am feeling itching right on that spot I just touched on the side of my neck. But I barely touched it in only one spot, so as long as I don't touch any other part, it should be okay. Anyway, I solved it by, after a while, by getting up, going to the bathroom and getting a very cold, wet washcloth with a tiny bit of soap on it and just not rubbing because that would have uh, really aggravated it, I think, but just gently moving it and soaking it into my skin. And that eventually, after 10 or 15 minutes, made the itching stop and um, started to take away the violently red um, rash it had produced. Sorry for that car sound. Um, so yeah, it, it was an immediate reaction, I would say, as this little itch on my side of my neck is. I say little because it was a very little spot, but it's actually quite intense. My fault, because I'm not using gloves and because I touched myself after I said I would not do that. Anyway, I just wanted you to be aware of that. So yeah, in addition to being toxically edible, you know, edibly toxic, yeah, they much more um, likely to cause a very aggravating skin reaction. So don't touch them and don't touch yourself when you touch them. Now let's finish planting. Okay, that's it. All of the dirt has been put on top. You know, that's a reason why I wasn't too worried about if I got actually six inches deep or only four or five inches deep because I did add soil on top. So it's a little bit mounded and the hyacinth are in and I'm gonna go wash my hands before we do the last bowl planting out front. Okay, I'm gonna plant some more bulbs here. It is shady right now because it's about 3.45 and the sun has gone down behind my house behind me. But I'm still gonna get these last bulbs planted. So in this pot, which has um, some purple fountain grass that I need to cut back soon, I'll cut it back down to where it's just a few inches tall and it will shoot up nice and deep um, burgundy in the spring. It is really a gorgeous plant, but it's on its last leg right now um, in the sense that it goes, it would look this good if you can call it good through another month or two. But if I cut it back now, it will start regrowing in February. So in this pot around it, and I have another one over um, to the other side of the front, this area, I'm going to plant some allium, some allium atropurpurium. There's 15 in this bag, and supposedly you plant them 10 inches apart. Hmm, gonna crowd that a bit. But look at that color, burgundy. It says full sun, and these do get full sun. This area is um, facing east, and it gets sun until, um, really intense sun, until in the spring and summer until about uh, 6 p.m. So yeah, I'm gonna divide these up five in this one and five in my other container with on my purple fountain grass over to the right. All right, definitely have a rooty side 
and a little bit of a pointy side. So, in they go. Five in this one. One, two, three. Four and five. That is done. Now I'm going to do the others. This is the other one, the other purple fountain grass. And we're going to put the bulbs in this one. go. Two more. I just, you know, stirred up the dirt just a tiny little bit with my garden trowel. This is pretty soft. Okay, so that's done. What's next? So this big pot has some stuff that's going to come up in it. In fact, I can see some little strands coming up already. I am going to stick a few of these um, Allium atropurpureums in here just, just for fun because, again, they're going to come up. They can come up amidst these other plants. And these are about uh, 10 inches no, not 10 inches. What are they? They're about 25 inches tall and they have a, a burgundy color. And I think that that's going to look good here next to the snapdragons. The Chantilly peach is what I think those are. So normally you like to plant bulbs uh, kind of packed in, but because there's already stuff coming up in there, I don't need to do that. So the next bulb I'm going to plant is an allium drumstick and they are about 24 inches tall and have a purple color as well. All these purple ones, I do love purple. Um, they are different shades of purple and I have a lot of other colors, lots of oranges and um, burgundies and yellows and pinks. So I would like some more purples. So I'm going to plant them in this pot right here, which had dianthus in it, uh, Sweet William, sometimes called. And that dianthus was doing pretty well, but it was over seven years old. Who knows how long it was planted before I moved here, but it was definitely here when I got here. One of the very few flowers that was. They're just really old, so I decided to take them out because they've never really been my favorites anyway. And now I'm going to plant these allium here, drumstick alliums. So I'm finding it hard to believe. They say to plant these 10 inches apart. And uh, that seems kind of weird because they're so small. Pardon my dirty fingers, guys, but I'm digging in the dirt. So anyway, they are very tiny. And you can see the roots right there. So we're going to put them in. But I'm not putting them in 10 inches apart. I'm going to put them in, I'm going to call that six inches. I might be exaggerating, but you know, what, what's, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst that could happen is that they don't do well, but I have seen so many people plant their bulbs close together that I'm going to risk it. I'm also not technically planting them a full five inches deep, like it says to do. What can I say? I'm a risk taker. I'm planting them about three inches deep. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm really pushing it on these ones I'm putting in the middle. They're only like two inches apart. I shouldn't do that. Huh? Maybe I should take one out. I'll take one out. How's that? I can find them. Oh, can't find it. Never mind. By the way, that's how you get one that's sideways, but it'll come up anyway. <laughs> okay, guys, so you can be a rule follower and do exactly what the bulbs say, bulb directions say. They do come 
very clearly listed there. You could also use gloves and not get filthy hands like me, but you know, I do what I do and I get pretty flowers and that's all I care about. <laughs> So I planted the rest of the allium drumsticks in this parallel container on the other side of the yard area. And there were a few left over, so I planted them in this uh, square wooden container with my martini tree. That martini tree doesn't get very big, but it has gorgeous tiny little rosy blossoms. I say rosy because they're, they're a combination of light and dark pink and they're tiny and they're just so pretty. I think that the uh, purple, uh, alliums will look good in there. Um, there's a few other flowers in there. It will be a combination, which I kind of like. And I did the same. There was about six left. So I put three in here and I did the same on the other end in the uh, other container like this. Well, it's starting to get pretty cold out here, guys. Thankfully, I've just finished. You know, I almost didn't tape today's video because I thought it's planting bulbs. It's so simple. Um, I mean, I've never even really done it much I've just a few times and uh, that was enough to show me that oh you move aside a little dirt you put the bulb in and you cover it up and because bulbs have everything they need in them that's really all you have to do and they magically come up in the spring and that's what makes planting bulbs so awesome so exciting is that not only do you have to do so little but then when you cover them up nothing happens for a while there's these several months that go by depending on when you plant them that they're sort of just sleeping there, biding their time, and then suddenly they burst into life. One at a time, they come up and they brighten your garden and your life when not much else is growing. Before you get a chance to get your vegetables up and running, and before some of your other flowers, your perennials are blooming, those spring bulbs come up. And it's just really exciting. And I'm so glad I made time to do more of them purposefully this year. And I am glad I did the videotape too, because you can see now that um, you can follow the directions. They're listed real clearly for you. And even if you lose the paperwork, you can look it up online. It's super easy to find. And you can follow them to a T and they will work beautifully that way. However, you can also do it my way, which is, <laughs> you know, pushing the boundaries a bit. Maybe not going quite as deep or quite as far apart. And you know what? It will still work. In fact, you might even end up liking it better. Take a look at that tree collard. It's getting pretty massive. <laughs> the leaves just keep getting bigger and bigger and it keeps growing taller and taller. Well, it's New Year's Eve. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe time tonight. And hey, we are finally heading into 2021 and it is going to be great. It is going to be wonderful. And, and that's what I'm sticking with. <laughs> and I actually have some very interesting plans for this year and the next year or two. Pretty big life change I've decided on and I'll tell you more about that in the days to come. See you next time, guys. Happy New Year.